Hello, everyone. Hello. <laughs> We're about to get started, if I can have your attention. To stand unguarded on a naked stage and tell a true story is an act of courage. To sit in an audience, to give an hour of your time to listen to a true story is an act of generosity. Tonight, acts of courage and generosity will be rewarded. Welcome to Stanford I Screwed Up, the fourth annual celebration of failure and resilience. I'm Michelle McGee, I'll be your MC for tonight, and I've been working with all of the performers on their stories for the past few months, and I'm really excited for you to hear them. Our show is presented by The Resilience Project, a resource that was launched in 2011 to help normalize failure and help students develop a sense of bravery around sharing their stories. The Resilience Project is one of several student learning programs in the Office of the Vice Provost for Teaching and Learning. Tonight's stories cover some hard topics and may bring up some uncomfortable feelings. If you want to talk to someone about anything that comes up for you, please check in with one of our volunteers. They're all wearing t-shirts like that. For those of you unfamiliar with the layout here, there are bathrooms in the back through the glass doors. Also, if you know anyone who can't be here tonight, we are live streaming this event on Facebook right now. You can search Stanford I Screwed Up and you'll find it. Now, please welcome to the stage our first performer, Avery Rogers. I lost my first bout of faith in my father when I was 10 years old. Before that age, he wasn't perfect. He'd pass out on the couch after drinking a few too many beers more nights than not, and he wasn't very emotionally attached, but he would bring us to Baskin Robbins, take me to rec soccer games, and in general was good enough. But one night when I was 10, my dad didn't come home from work uh, that night, and I learned later that he'd been arrested and taken to jail for a DUI. I don't know what the fines were and what the legal process was, but I did know that we had to get breathalyzers installed in both of our family cars. This was incredibly annoying for me, my mom, and my siblings because the machine often gave false positives, so we'd get stranded in parking lots or in our garage, and I'd subsequently be late to school. It was also really embarrassing to have to explain to my friends why my mom had to blow into a tube every time we wanted to take them somewhere. It may not have been a good thing that I lost faith in my dad at such an early age, but it definitely proved useful when, three years later, I was sitting next to him on a flight back from visiting my grandparents over spring break. He, to my dismay, had ordered a few drinks, had bought the Wi-Fi, and was doing some work stuff on his computer. And I looked over, you know, naturally as you would, and I saw that he was on his Gmail account. He either turned the screen away or gave me a funny look, and I got this suspicious feeling in my gut. So when I got home a few days later, while he was watching a Missouri Tigers game, uh, I got his computer out of his bag, found out his password, and went through his Gmail chat history. Uh, he'd been talking a lot to a woman named Katie, and some of the messages and emojis they'd been sending back and forth aren't appropriate for anyone, let alone married colleagues at work. I was nervous, and I didn't know what this meant for the future of my parents' marriage, but I did tell my mom what I'd seen, and she confronted my dad a few days later. He confessed to having an affair, and a few days after that, took me out to this local park. We sat on this log near the back, very quiet, and he just started bawling. I mean, the full waterworks, like the full performance. I'm so sorry. Like, I promise I'll be better. Your mom and I have decided to stay married, but I'm going to stop drinking, and it's going to be better for you and for all of us. And I was like, you know what, Dad? Bullshit. You drank away the first 13 years of my life, and you just had an affair that I discovered on your Gmail chat history? No, no promises. I want you out. I want you gone. I want you guys divorced. And I want justice. That's what I fought for for the next five years. About once a week, I'd sit down with my mom, you know, in the car at home, and I'd say, so mom, how's dad? How's your relationship? Are you guys getting divorced yet? How about now? How about now? And every week, she'd give me a similar response. No, our marriage isn't perfect, but a lot of marriages aren't, and I want to stay in this for the kids and for the family because that's what's best for us. That's what's best for us? What's best for us is you staying with a man who drank away the first 15 years of your marriage, who had an affair with you, and who obviously does not love you anymore? That's what's best for us? No, what's best for us is justice. 
but justice was not served in the time that I spent at home before I came to Stanford. And when I got to Stanford, you know, I started classes, made new friends, life was exciting, and I wasn't at home, so I wasn't so focused on my parents' marriage. When I went back for winter break, I didn't know how I'd feel. But as soon as I walked into the house, I saw my parents hug, you know, just a casual hug. And I just got this reviling sensation, like when a five-year-old watches people kiss in the movies and they're like, ugh, gross. That's how I felt watching my parents hug. So that night, you know, for old time's sake, sat down with my mom and said the usual, how's dad? How's your relationship? Are you getting divorced yet? And this time she gave me a slightly different answer. She'd had a biopsy for skin cancer a few days before I got home, and she'd had skin cancer before, so was pretty sure it was uh, skin cancer again, and she said, you know, I actually am feeling pretty close to getting a divorce now, but with the skin cancer, I'll have to get surgery, and it'll be a long recovery process, and I don't want to be getting divorced and going through skin cancer recovery at the same time. So I saw this as an opportunity for a little deal. I said, hey, mom, how about if you don't have skin cancer, then you'll get a divorce? And she actually, to my surprise, said, sure. So we shook on it. And we're pretty serious about promises in my family, but since this wasn't just a promise that she hadn't eaten the last Oreo in the package, I decided to up the ante a little bit. I said, all right, mom, so if you don't get, have skin cancer, but you don't get a divorce, then you owe me $10,000. To which she again said, yes, okay, and we shook on it. And I'm feeling pretty good at this point because either my parents get divorced, which I've wanted for years, or I get 10 grand transferred straight into my bank account. Uh, we got a call a few days later from the doctor confirming that no, my mom did not have skin cancer. Pretty exciting. I've got my two options, waiting for my ultimatum. And my mom sits me down later that night and I say, you know, the deal, what do you choose? She said, Avery, I'm not going through with the deal. I'm not getting, I can't just get divorced like that on a whim and I'm not going to give you $10,000. And I realized how ridiculous it was that I'd bet my mom that she should get a divorce from her marriage or have to give me $10,000. I don't know where that $10,000 would have came from, but that was the deal. And I realized that all that fighting, all that anger that I'd had was a failure, that I had failed. I failed my mom by nagging her and making her feel guilty for staying in her marriage. I'd failed my siblings by polluting our family time and essentially ignoring my dad while they were around. And I'd failed myself by holding on to this active anger and resentment when I could have chosen, if not forgiveness for my father, then at least acceptance of the things I could not control. Justice is a virtue, but it's not the only virtue and it's not always the right virtue to pursue. There are also the virtues of compassion and optimism. So when I go home and deal with my family, these are the virtues that I want to focus on so that regardless of what happens between my parents in the future, I can be a force of stability and happiness for my mom and my siblings because that is what's best for us. Thank you. So as our performers are sharing their stories of failure and resilience, we're also inviting you all to share stories with us in the form of six words. So you can see on some tables, there are little pieces of paper and you can write your six word story about failure and resilience. And I have some of them here. I'm gonna read some. Failed CS106A exams, still chugging. I let my whole team down. Biggest mistake, not believing in myself. Thank you for writing those. Keep writing them. I'll keep reading them. And now, please welcome to the stage our next performer, Amit Pasupathi. Fall of my sophomore year, I took a class, you may have heard of it, Computer Science 103, Mathematical Foundations of Computing. I went into that class feeling like hot shit. I had just come out of a great summer working in China, I had made a LinkedIn account and had almost 100 connections, 
and <laughs> and was just feeling like I was on top of the world. I had gotten a new Facebook profile picture and was just racking up the likes. I was on a roll. <laughs> Every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 1.30 to 3, I would skip with glee to Huang Engineering Center thinking, hey now, hey now, this is what dreams are made of. <laughs> Truly a classic of our generation. I would then sit in lecture thinking, I'm ready to fulfill my Lizzie McGuire-esque math dreams, and subsequently leave lecture thinking, I don't know what my dreams are made of at all. In fact, I didn't know anything anymore. As I looked at each problem set, the first thing that came to mind was, well, I can go to office hours. I'm sure I could get some help there. And indeed, to office hours I went. I would open the doors of Huang's infamous basement and immediately be overwhelmed by the scent of desperation. 106, 107, 109, 110, 120, 124, 161, 221, 229, any combination of three numbers in the computer science department led innocent undergraduates to face their impending demise. I would make my way through the littered remains of hope and sit at the 103 table. I'm feeling so insecure because A, everyone around me seems to know what they're doing, B, everyone is so good at what they're doing, C, I don't know what to ask the TA, and D, I am 100% sure that no one else feels the same way. I'm just a burden on anyone. Then came the first midterm. I came out of it thinking, yo, this wasn't too bad. I'm just being too hard on myself. So I marched my way straight to TAP, got myself a nice Nutella milkshake, subsequently dropped the Nutella milkshake all over myself on the way back to my dorm, but I was feeling such a high that I didn't care. Perhaps a week later, the grades came back. I noticed a lot of red marks on my exam. I thought, breathing hard, heart racing like Usain Bolt, armpits sweating like Niagara Falls. I took a look at my score. 45 out of 100. I tried rationalizing. I'm sure everyone scored the same. The median score, 92. Well, of course I got a 45. I just didn't study hard enough. I need to do more practice exams, do more problem sets, more study sheets, more, more, more. I'm understanding the material. I'm not just memorizing and regurgitating it, right? Then came the second exam. I th went into it thinking it would go swell. Well, oh well. Same thing happened. 45, median was a 92 or a 93. And that's when it finally hit me. I understand nothing, absolutely nothing. Brute force had blinded me into thinking I was some sort of superstar, but I was just a washed up backup actor in LA. But while this memorizing and regurgitating was happening, I was becoming someone I never want to be again. I would sit in my room for hours, poring over problem sets, not wanting to see anyone. I had a short temper, I would forget to eat sometimes, and I just felt like Stanford sucked. I didn't want to see any of my friends. I knew I was just a burden on them. CS 103 was my first priority, but in all of the wrong ways. And little did I know at the time, my friends were quite worried about me. I'm usually a happy-go-lucky kind of guy, and I just went missing my sophomore fall. Those last three weeks of the quarter, I felt like a shell of a human being. I couldn't bring myself to try or laugh or cry or smile or study or do anything of value. I just wanted the quarter to end. I came out of the final exam feeling so defeated. I just felt like laughing and crying simultaneously because I did so poorly in this course. What? That night, I make my way back to my room. I'm feeling in a daze and I just want to chill out for some time. And laying on the floor, I see this one jar. It's pretty jank looking, it's kind of big. It's filled with colorful notes, thinking maybe it held notes, or held candy rather, back in 1983. And it's just sitting there in the floor of my two room double outer room, room 230, Lantana. <laughs> Ooh, yikes. <laughs> I'm thinking, is this some sort of prank? And then my friends come out and tell me that they wrote 103 things that they love about me. Just read a few here. You're so dedicated to being there for others and to understand how you can be of service. A classic amid spotlights question. How can I better support you? 
You make people feel comfortable and valued when they're around you. You're handsome, here's my number, let's date. <laughs> I think that's more of a Stanford I succeeded kind of story. <laughs> that night at the very same desk in which I poured over all of those goddamn problem sets, I read every single one of these green and pink, white and blue slips of paper. Every single green and pink, white and blue slip of paper reminded me that I'm not just a nameless, talentless math student who couldn't write proofs that made any sense. Every single green and pink, white and blue slip of paper reminded me that I'm not just my SUNET ID undergraduate in math and computational science. I'm Amit Pasupathy, human being. My friends love me for being a human being. After reading every single one of these green and pink, white and blue slips of paper, I cried a little bit and I smiled a lot. As I underwent my personal torture that was CS103, I had so many gaps in formal logic. I couldn't figure out how to make theories into proofs or translate ideas into sentences. But only now do I realize I had one big, huge, gigantic gap in personal logic. I didn't know how to value myself, and I was filling it with copies of my transcript. But it was this jar and my friends that made me realize I'm worth so much more. They knew that 103 kicked my ass. In fact, they celebrated how hard 103 kicked my ass. Yes, CS 103, its theories, its problem sets, its exams, they don't define me. They didn't affect how much my friends care for me, so how should they affect how much I care for or value myself? When you look at Carta, the first thing you check is the distribution of A's and B's, right? Well, for CS 103, I want you to look at that D. That 2%, you always wonder, who is that guy? That's me. <laughs> nice to meet you. And that 2%, that's me. I'm not afraid to admit that I got that. In fact, I'm proud. Because of my friends, this jar, and that D, I was freed from the painful handcuff that is Stanford's hyperactive, overachieving academic culture. So now, I'm redoing it. This quarter, I'm in CS 103 again. I'm also in CS 103A for extra help and problem sets. And I'm not in any other hard math courses. I know that I have an academic support system and many more jars to help pick me up when I fall down. I'm a little older and wiser. I feel stronger about my values. And I know why I'm here at Stanford. And I know, oh boy do I know, that my grades don't define me. Stanford, I screwed up, but I'm back on my feet and ready to try again. Thank you. Thanks, Amit. I'm gonna read a couple more of your six word stories about failure and resilience. Listlessness, seeing others' success on Facebook. That is real. Um, Got a 32 on chem. Yay, good job. What's a 30? I don't know what that means, but that's okay. Um, I wish you'd miss me back. Please welcome to the stage our next performer, Tatiana Reinbobin. I met Ed when I was 16. 16, we all know that awkward age. It's the time in our lives when we're trying to discover ourselves, find ourselves. I was a happy 16-year-old though, at least initially, at the German school in Mexico City. I was making new friends, liking my classes, and going to a lot of quinceañera parties. But then all of a sudden, my best friend Paola had a boyfriend. And this other girl I would hang out with a lot was being admired by all the guys. At quinceañera parties, I ended up being the third wheel, the fifth wheel, the seventh wheel. Then, Ed came along. He grabbed my hand and he told me that he was going to be the partner in crime I'd so desperately been looking for. He was going to make me the perfect Tatiana I thought I wanted to be. What happened though, was that I grabbed his hand, the offer was quite tempting, but I quickly started losing weight. I was focusing more and more on school and isolating myself. Rather than feeling perfect, I was feeling sad and lonely and depressed. Because who is Ed? 
Ed is my eating disorder. Let me tell you one thing about Ed. Ed is the nastiest boyfriend or girlfriend you can possibly think of. He took complete control of me and set a fire inside of me that was burning me up. I tried getting a divorce from Ed, but I couldn't. Try breaking up with him, but I couldn't because he would be right back at my door. My mom noticed that I was losing weight, but I would make up all these excuses that Ed was whispering in my ear. A few arguments with my mom turned into yelling and fighting, and on top of that, my sister also started a relationship with Ed. So now my Ed was competing against her Ed, who was faster in the swimming pool, on the running track, who was more popular. I have to admit that there were many nights where I went to bed hoping not to wake up anymore. After about three years, my parents decided that my sister and I had to start treatment. But treatment wasn't great. The focus was just on food. No one was asking me about my feelings of sadness and loneliness and depression. I wanted to speak up and say that my family needed help, but I couldn't because Et was telling me not to. Regardless, I left to college. I went to UC San Diego for undergrad, and at first I was loving it. Ed and I were doing long distance. But over my four years at UCSD, Ed started visiting me more and more. And well, eventually he moved to San Diego, and now we did really get married. I tried treatment again, but it wasn't working. Nevertheless, I got into Stanford, my dream school. I was gonna major in environmental engineering and science, a subject I was really passionate about. I had still agreed though to keep going to therapy. So week two, I went to Aiden Health. The nurse came in and took my vital signs. I was waiting for the doctor, not expecting to hear anything too new or too different. But the doctor came in and looked at my vital signs and looked at me and said, your heart rate is so low right now that during your sleep it is even lower and you could die during your sleep. I felt complete shock, complete disbelief. How could I have gotten this far? Because Stanford, it's week two and I'd already screwed up. I cried for an hour, biggest breakdown of my life, of course. The doctor explained to me that it is actually quite common to find people with eating disorders here at Stanford because we all try to be perfect, successful in every aspect of our lives. The doctor also wanted me to go to hospital. But foolish me, so controlled by Ed in that moment, did not go to hospital. I had found a little spark of happiness here, though, that Tatiana wanted to hold on to. So I stayed at Stanford, but still kept going to therapy, seeing my doctor and my psychologist every week during fall quarter. But it didn't really help, because even though I was eating a little bit better, Ed was telling me to work out more. And thus, over winter break, I went to inpatient treatment. No, I did not go to Sacramento to spend Christmas with my friends there. I went to inpatient treatment and the worst Christmas of my life. In fact, because I hated it so much, I left right after two weeks and came straight back to Stanford, where my little spark of happiness was something that kept me going. Three great things happened right after treatment, though. First great thing that happened was that a not-so-great therapist at this treatment center gave me a book called Life Without Ed. In this book, Jenny, an anorexia and bulimia survivor, talks about her eating disorder as this relationship with Ed. She gave me the language that I'm using here with you today. Through her, I learned that I had to separate my Tatiana voice from Ed's voice in my mind. And this actually made me question, was it Ed who had screwed up or was it I who had screwed up? It's a blurry line. The second great thing that happened was that back here at Stanford, I joined a body image group. Once a week, I would meet up with three other people who also had a relationship with Ed and we would talk about relationship problems, how to separate our voices from Ed's voice. And the third and best great thing that happened was that my mom, back in Mexico, had also read a book written by an anorexia and bulimia survivor. And the author, Andrea, became my therapist. We started Skyping once a week. She is the first person who absolutely understands me. With her, though, I've had to face my feelings and not walk away from them. I've realized how it was this initial lack of admiration from guys that led me to start a relationship with Ed. 
how my mom's perfectionism just made everything worse, and how the conflict between my sister and I was just the worst that could have possibly happened. Now with Andrea, I've cried a lot, felt frustration and regret, but I've also forgiven people and forgiven myself. I've definitely started the divorce process from Ed, but we all know that divorce is never easy. I'm still fighting a battle with a lot of ups and downs, but certainly a lot more ups than downs at this point. With Andrea, I've realized that my passion for the environment and for human and animal rights is something that really keeps me going. I found beauty in life again, and I really do want to live at this point. This is the first time that I'm openly talking about my relationship with Ed. And because of this, I'm going to treat myself for a delicious vegan dessert right after this. No, Ed, no. You do not have the last word today. I do. Thank you. I'm going to read a couple more six-word stories from all of you. Dad cares by asking about deadlines. I'm 25 and I can't drive. Giving presentation, typed password in plain text. <laughs> um, please welcome our next performer, Oluwashon Adabagbo. Nigeria born, Boston raised, Cali made. I grew up believing problems are not meant to be shared, that excuses are tools of the incompetent, and there is no reason on this earth that I shouldn't succeed in life. You see, my favorite number is one. I love being first. I get things done right the first time. In high school, I was number one. Tell me something once, I got it. I soon realized that would change. Coming to Stanford, I knew I wanted to be a child and adolescent psychiatrist, but had no sense of direction towards that goal. All my life, they told me to get into a good college, but no one told me how to get into medical school. Take 31A, they said. So I just did what all the other pre-meds were doing. They tell you all the classes you need to take but forget to tell you to do well. The funny thing is everyone is quick to say they are taking 20 units but get silent when you ask who's struggling. The friends I spent the 23 out of the 24 hours of the day were getting A's while I kept saying C's get degrees. But C's don't get into medical school. At least that's what they told me. Discouraged and defeated, the one star student wasn't shining so bright anymore. Depression became my best friend and motivation became my enemy. I walked into a pre-med advisor's office hoping to find a solution to what seemed like a life-ending problem. She made the false assumption that I was just another black girl who claimed I wanted to be a doctor and had nothing to show for it. She looked at my GPA and said, Maybe you should stop going on ice cream dates with friends and focus on school a little bit more. Fighting back tears, I was pissed. How dare she come to the conclusion that my mediocre GPA was because I was too social. She gave me numbers I knew I could not attain, so needless to say, she wasn't helpful. I was left with no choice but to continue pre-med classes. My intelligence wasn't the issue. Mentally, emotionally, physically, I wasn't ready for the hard work to be a doctor. But after a year-long break from pre-med, deep in my heart, I knew medicine was still for me. <sighs> okay, girl, it's time to pick yourself back up and make a game plan. All I wanted was to do well in school. 
I found solace in the people that couldn't quite give me what I wanted, but what I needed. Love. I fell into this place called Cass. <laughs> called love. Called home. With open arms, they resurrected the idea that I too could still be a doctor. They began to address me as Dr. Adabagbo. I jumped back into pre-med classes my junior year. Then seeing my GPA from that quarter made me feel like I'd never be a doctor. This was my second chance. This was supposed to be the 180, the uphill rise. I had all the motivation in the world and still didn't do well that quarter. After a winter break of tears and despair, I realized crying wasn't gonna raise my GPA. I'm a pick yourself up by the bootstraps kind of girl. Stanford wasn't gonna fight for me, so I had to fight for myself. I was quick to beat myself up about failing, yet slow to give myself another chance. I forgot that this thing called chance was limitless. Forgiving. Welcoming. This thing called chance said that I could try again. This thing called chance did not promise that I wouldn't fall, but promised that I can get back up. This thing called chance said that my GPA is not a measure of my intelligence, but a test of my resilience. This thing called chance said that I, Oluwashon Adedoyin Adebagbo, would be a doctor. This thing called chance. Reflecting on my four years at Stanford, I have to work 10 times harder than everyone else to get the same results. I've learned to advocate for myself, to find people who want to see me succeed, to share my struggles and celebrate my successes no matter how small. I've learned to love myself every step of the way. I could have viewed my obstacles as failures and given up, but I chose to redefine my failures as growth. And my heart goes out to every Nigerian girl from a low-income immigrant background who went to a small charter school in the heart of Boston who got into Stanford and thought she could define success the same way she did all her life, by getting good grades. And my heart goes out to every doctor that could have been, that would have been, that should have been, but didn't, because they thought they messed up. They thought they had one chance. Second chances weren't a thing. That second chances were a figment of our imagination, and those who dare try again would not succeed. Those who believe in this false notion that pre-med advisors are fortune tellers and general chemistry determines their fate. So Stanford, I didn't screw up. You did. Okay. From the moment I walked onto campus, I was not set up for success. I didn't know what office hours were. I didn't know you had to study to do well. So congratulations. You played yourself. Because everything you thought would bring me down has only made me stronger. And I no longer call myself a C student because I get good grades. I weave words of doubt into sweet sounds of success. I've managed to hang out with friends and still ace my biochem midterm. But you, Stanford, you can do better. Because there's still students of color who feel the same way I did. And while medical school is a couple years away from me, I'm just rooting for everyone black. Caterpillars everywhere. On clothing, in mouth. Good image. It's hydrogen peroxide, not contact solution. Rejected from all five PhD programs. Please welcome to the stage our next performer, Taryn Imamura. (laughs) 
This isn't your typical story of success and failure. I didn't fail a test or a class. I wasn't transported. I wasn't suspended. I didn't fail to achieve any of the goals that I had set for myself. Stanford, I screwed up on a much more fundamental level. My freshman year revolved around three things. Hanging out with my amazing friends, learning about cool stuff in my classes, and overcoming my very crippling anxiety and depression. While I was overcoming my own personal issues, I looked at my friends and my peers and how they were succeeding at such cool things, and I developed this clear idea of what I thought a Stanford student was. In my mind, a Stanford student got amazing grades in ridiculously hard classes. They majored in something impressive and they did research. They volunteered and they were involved in communities on campus. They had friends, they worked out, they party and had fun on the weekends. And more than that, they weren't just excited about what they were doing, but they were excited about life. So everything that I didn't think that I was and everything that I thought my depression kept me from doing every day. When I came back sophomore year, I was determined to overcome the failures of before. I was determined to replace the anxiety and depression in my life with becoming a badass Stanford student. And I was gonna become who I thought I should be. So within the first couple weeks of the quarter, I declared my major in engineering physics with a focus in electromechanical systems design, two fields that I am so passionate about. I got a part-time job doing research at the Slack Linear Accelerator, and for the first time, I was involved in communities on campus. I rushed a sorority, shout out to my Chi Omega sisters. <laughs> I volunteered with Camp Kesem and Seeds of Change, and I was meeting new people and making new friends every day. And I was going out and partying and having fun on the weekends. And on top of all this, I maintained pretty stellar grades in the four physics classes I was enrolled in. So, I had not only become what many of you would consider successful, but I had become what I thought a Stanford student was, and I had become who I thought I should have been since the beginning of my freshman year. And I wish the story ended there, but then I wouldn't be standing up here talking to all of you. I assumed that my sophomore year would revolve around three things the same way my freshman year did. Having a great time with my friends, learning about cool stuff in my classes, and being the badass Stanford student that I now was. I am extra, I will not apologize. <laughs> in reality, my life was a much more fragile and hectic balance of my academics, my extracurriculars, my volunteer opportunities, my part-time job, hanging out with my friends, flaking on plans with friends, going to tutoring for my classes, and trying to maintain my own emotional and physical health. And let me tell you, that got very overwhelming very, very quickly. <laughs> but I went through the quarter with this attitude that, you know, next week is going to be better. Next week, I am going to have time to hang out with my friends. Next week, I'm going to finally understand what's happening in my classes. Next week will be less stressful. And I kept telling myself that for seven weeks. And let me tell you, none of those weeks got any less stressful. If anything, they got a hell of a lot worse. Now, while I was busy balancing the shit show that had quickly become my life, I had the sinking feeling that I was probably missing out on some pretty important experiences. But, you know, I figured it's week seven, and that means big game week. I'm gonna go to gaieties with my friends, I'm gonna party with them afterwards, and I'm gonna go to big game, and I am going to have fun. I'm gonna make up for some of the experiences I have missed. I can do it all. I am a Stanford student, and doing it all is part of the job description. <laughs> So Friday night, I go to Gaiety's with my friends and I have an amazing time. I'm going with them afterwards to party when I get a call from someone in one of my PSEC groups. Hey Taryn, you know that project that counts for a pretty big portion of our grade? Well, the prof moved up the due date to tomorrow during big game. He's not giving any extensions and if we do not start working right now, there's no way we're gonna finish. I felt my entire night just come crumbling down around me. I caught up with my friends and told them what was up, and they said, you know, we understand, go and do what you have to do. But as I was leaving, I couldn't help but wonder, when was the last time I had hung out with some of my closest friends? And more than that, when was the last time that I hadn't been this stressed out? 
So I get to where people are working on the projects and the piece sets, and you know, they ordered Thai food, they're playing music, everyone's laughing and having a good time, and I figure, you know, this is not the night I wanted to have, but I can vibe with this. I'm still gonna have fun. My fun's just gonna involve a hell of a lot more physics than I would have originally preferred. <laughs> So I go over to where my piece at group is sitting and they're all talking and excited and saying, wow, and this is really, really hard, but it's so fulfilling to learn about it. And can you believe that we're learning about string theory as undergrads? String theory? When the hell did we start talking about string theory? We've been talking about the last couple weeks in class. You were like sitting right next to me when the prof was mentioning it. That's what that was? I didn't understand any of that. I haven't understood anything that's happened in this class for the past five weeks. Which kind of got me thinking, and I slowly came to the realization that despite the countless hours I sank into tutoring every week, and despite the really great grades listed under my name on Gradescope and Canvas, I was not learning anything in any of my classes. And that is a very scary realization. <laughs> So while everyone around me is having an amazing time in their experiences of intellectual vitality, I am sitting there silently having a panic attack because I'm realizing that in the process of becoming my idealized version of a Stanford student, I was failing at the two things that were most important to me from the beginning. Making connections with friends that I care about and learning about things that excite me in my classes. So later, most everyone's left and I am still working. A few friends from my physics classes come up and ask me, hey, how are you doing? <laughs> how am I doing? The last time someone asked me that question and I answered it honestly, I was told, but you have your shit more together than anyone else I know. You have no reason to feel like this. You shouldn't feel like a failure. But I did. So when my friends asked me a second time, I said, Leave me alone, I don't want to talk to you, just let me keep working on this, I have to keep working on this, please go away. And they asked me a third time, no, really, how are you doing? And I broke down and I told them everything that had been going on. They didn't just listen to me, but they validated how I felt, despite my fears that they wouldn't. Those friends supported me not just that night, but for countless nights afterwards, as I reevaluated what was important to me, and they supported and encouraged me when I took actions to prioritize those things that I care about the most. I ended my fall quarter in a very different way than I began it. Instead of sitting in a dark room by myself, stressing out and frantically working on P sets and job applications and work, I was sitting in the floor of my dorm room with my friends eating snacks, listening to music, singing Disney songs, making very inappropriate jokes, and vowing that, you know, we might not look so great on Canvas and Gradescope, but damn it, we are gonna have more fun than everybody else we know combined. So today, I'm not your ideal Stanford student. I don't get amazing grades in super hard classes, but I love what I am studying, and I am excited to go to class every day. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, I'm not done yet. I really am not. <laughs> I'm not involved in every extracurricular and volunteer research opportunity that I want to be, but those few things that I prioritize excite me, and I am proud of the effort I put into them. Don't get me wrong, I still have really hard days, but I've learned how to ask for help and talk about it, and how to give myself a break. And finally, for the first time, I'm putting time into the, the relationships to cultivate the, the relationships I have with other people and my friends. And not just that, but I'm putting time into cultivating a better relationship with myself. So I am not the Stanford student that my freshman self dreamed of becoming, but I hope that I'm one that she could be proud of. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. I have some more six word stories. Here we go. The midterm exacted a ruthless revenge. I like that. Got period, blood everywhere. I am dodgeball. 
that was amazing. Just come out. They already know. And with that, I'd like to welcome our final performer of the evening, Liana Holston. Fall quarter 2016. I'm in Manhattan for the Stanford in New York program, doing an internship during the day and taking classes at night. One of the classes that I take focuses on the changing cultural audience of New York City. The guy who teaches it is the CEO of a marketing firm whose clients include the Met and the National Gallery of Art. He's friends with the producer of Hamilton. The CEO is a big deal. He and I, however, do not see eye to eye on if and when human emotions should be displayed. He thinks never, I think always. He refused to talk about the election while I openly wept about it in front of all three of my bosses. During week three, our class gets to see Hamilton. This musical got me through a rough quarter sophomore fall. I have every line memorized. I'm currently interning at the theater where the show opened. The first three notes of the show play, I immediately start crying, and I don't stop until after the curtain falls. Our class congregates outside, the CEO clocks the puffiness of my eyes, and thus begins weeks of him ridiculing me for having an emotional experience during Hamilton. I mean, come on, you'd have to be a robot or a CEO of marketing, apparently, to not cry at some point during that show. Our final assignment is a 20 minute individual presentation. Now, 20 minutes by yourself for a six person class. Nothing we prepare matters, I figure, because the CEO is gonna tear it all down anyway. I've watched him do it for 10 weeks. I go into the presentation without having practiced the thing once. Like, not even a little bit. I stand up, the nerves kick in, and I ramble about how great this museum is. 10 minutes in, my palms are shaking, my palms are sweating, my voice is shaking, and the CEO interrupts me to ask, what is your thesis? Hmm, a good question. <laughs> the presentation ends and the CEO quietly says, Liana, may I speak to you in the hallway for a moment? Never a good string of words to hear. Then it gets worse. He sits me down and proceeds to inform me, that was the worst thing you've done in class. It doesn't show you've learned anything over the past 10 weeks. Rewrite the paper and send it to me by the end of the day tomorrow. Truly the stuff of nightmares. I text my boss from work. Hi, uh, I'm so sorry this is so short notice, but I failed the presentation tonight and the only hope of raising my grade is entirely rewriting the paper. Is there any way I can get tomorrow off? Also, sorry for any typos in this, my hands won't really stop shaking. Holy shit, of course, absolutely. Is this that jerk professor guy again? I'm so sorry. Yeah, it's him. Uh, thank you. Sorry for being trash. One, you are not trash. Two, there are zero things here to apologize for. You are not trash. Oh, that's right, I'm not. Maybe I'm even recycling or <laughs> compost. For the latter half of 2016, I had adopted the phrase, I am trash, into my vocabulary to diffuse tension, to preemptively excuse myself if I felt nervous about something, to get my peers to laugh. In moments where I felt silly or embarrassed or somehow less than, I found myself automatically saying, oh, <laughs> I'm trash. It worked, it got laughs, but I was making that joke so often that I started to believe it. I started to internalize the notion that I was actually garbage, something to be tossed aside, worthless. You are not trash. Remarkable how four words can change the way you talk to yourself. I had found a shortcut in social interactions by putting myself down in order to lift up those around me, by casting myself in a negative, goofy, it could be worse, you could be me, light. 
after that text exchange, I removed the phrase from my vocabulary and resolved to steer away from self-deprecating humor. This, it turns out, is really freaking hard. <laughs> and it brings up a lot of questions. I've been making people laugh this way since I was 10 years old. Who am I without this? What is my humor now if not self-deprecating? How do I make you laugh while still being kind to myself? What comes next? A, that was a Hamilton reference, thank you. <laughs> and B, I don't know yet. I'm still discovering answers to these questions. This is a whole new path I am trotting down. It's going pretty well so far. I mean, this was a five minute presentation and I prepared the bejesus out of it, so <laughs> it's a good sign. And I do know one thing, I am not trash. None of us are. Thank you. Thank you, Liana. Now that our performers have shared their stories, it's your turn. Raise your hand if you've ever felt like you failed academically. Wow. <laughs> Keep, keep, keep your hands up. You, you got it. Raise your hand if you've ever felt like you failed trying to do the right thing. If you've ever reclaimed a dream that you thought that failure had ruined. If you've ever stayed in a destructive relationship. If you've ever thought you were trash. If you've ever failed to put yourself out there because you were scared of failing. Yes. Take a look around. Keep them up, keep them up. Look at the fantastic company you're in. Now put your hands together for our amazing performers. <laughs> Also, thank you to Coho um, for hosting this event. Thank you, for, thank you to the Office of the Vice Provost for Teaching and Learning. And thank you to Adina Glickman, the director and creator of this amazing event. Give it up one more time.